So this is so this is financial institutions and this is lecture number eight in the series, right? And this is the second part on thrifts. So first section was the background information, the second section was liabilities, the third section was assets, the fourth section was regulation, the five, fifth section, which is now is uh, section five. Risk. Risk. All right, so the first type of risk is liquidity. Liquidity risk is usually the most important in financial institutions. And somehow liquidity risk, let me see if they have it actually separately. Yes, they have it separately. It is about managing basic withdrawals, managing redemptions. So nothing really special. They manage it by using government securities, by using highly liquid uh, corporate securities, and by using uh, repos, by using uh, short-term lending facilities. So they will have an access to a major bank, and maybe they'll have a credit line which they won't be using unless they really need it. Nothing really special or interesting uh, here. If they get sh longer term needs, the basic solution is to sell assets or to issue securities. Professor, uh, by, for example, for the normal companies, uh, liquidity risk, how do, can they manage it? The normal, not banks. Not so, banks. so for corporations, yeah. well, how they manage liquidity, this is what in corporate finance you have usually one big section, one part of the textbook called sh managing short term financing. So the short term asset side and the short term liability side. So you have two, three, sometimes four chapters which every textbook in corporate finance uh, is uh, discussing. And most textbooks have it under the section called working, working capital. All right. So working capital is associated with short-term assets and short-term liabilities. How you manage the short-term assets, how you manage the liabilities. And every single corporate finance textbook has a usually a whole part, usually two, three, or four chapters which detail how you manage liquidity. So working capital is essentially for corporations the uh, liquidity. All right. So management of uh, let's say credit risk. Credit risk is usually uh, managed through standard uh, procedures. You usually evaluate borrowers, nothing really uh, big, uh, nothing really interesting. The really interesting stuff is the so-called interest rate rate. Risk, interest rate risks exist for one very basic reason. Uh, financial institutions usually borrow, borrow short and lend long. I've explained already this uh, before. Borrowing short means borrowing with short maturity and lending with long maturity and the difference is that they open up a so-called maturity gap maturity uh, gap is associated with the difference between the weighted average of maturity on assets, uh, which is lending long, and on liabilities. So this is the maturity gap, 
And usually, the measure associated with uh, the maturity of assets and liability is called duration. Duration. So if there is a maturity gap, we need to mind the time as much. All right. So first of all, yes. So first of all, duration is the concept from corporate finance or in elementary finance, which tells you what is the weighted average of an asset or of liability. So it is the weighted average of a cash flow, of a cash flow, and represents the interest rate sensitivity. So it weighs a cash flow in such a way that it provides identical interest rate sensitivity to a single payment. And if it is identical interest rate sensitivity to, to a three month payment, the duration is three months. If it's identical to one year, the duration is one year. If the, it's identical to 10 years, it is 10 year duration. So duration is measured for a cash flow and measures the interest rate sensitivity. Interest rate sensitivity. So the maturity gap is also known as respectively the duration gap, which is the gap between the, uh, the duration of the assets and the liability. And the duration gap is the measure of interest rate risk. So duration measures the sensitivity of the one, the sensitivity of the other. When borrowing short and lending long, results in, let's write it out to be quite sure that you uh, remember it uh, in general, results in huge profits, results in huge profits when interest rates are falling. When interest rates are falling, it results in huge profits. There are two equivalent ways to think about it. The simplest way to think about it is you borrow at 5%, you lend at 10% as certain profits. When interest rates go down, you borrow at 2%, but you still lend at 10% because you lend a 30-year fixed interest mortgage. All right, so when interest goes down, profits increase and results in losses uh, when interest rates Increase. rise. So usually uh, banks and financial institutions are highly profitable during uh, an environment of falling interest rates. Well, this is what we had for 10 years in Bulgaria. And when I was discussing in Bulgarian media and whatnot that no banker in Bulgaria had any experience with rising interest rates, they kind of said, well, what's the problem? What's the problem? Meaning, they didn't even understand what the problem would be when interest rates begin to rise, all right? They don't know how to react to it. Well, they don't know how to manage it. Well, they say, oh, no problem. We manage it with adjustable rate mortgages, to which I'm going to be coming in a few minutes. But it is important to understand that in falling interest rates are really good and rising interest rates are really bad. Usually, well, Saudi Arabia had falling interest rates for the last how many years? Many years, whatever. All right, I mean, I don't know the exact history of interest rates in Saudi Arabia, but once they begin to rise, you're going to see a sea change, a radical difference in the whole banking system. Well. Bulgaria is now living through it, and sooner or later, Saudi Arabia will. I mean, interest rates cannot stay low forever. Yeah, you can maintain them one more year, maybe two more years, maybe five more years, but sooner or later, interest rates will begin to rise, and then it's a whole different ball game altogether. All right? So, this is what uh, borrowing short and lending long means. This is the uh, interest rate risk. It's also called, uh, the, the, the whole process is called gap measurement. So, Professor, how could they protect themselves from interest rate risk? 
Well, that's uh, where I'm kind of like getting next. That's where I'm kind of like uh, where uh, getting next. I'm first trying to explain what it is, what it means, what it results, how do we usually measure it before we get to the management of the risk. All right, I'm just trying to explain what it is. All right, so, well, that's actually the next section. The next section is six in my textbook, which is interest rate risk management. Management. All right, so sooner or later, you will get an interest rate exposure if you're doing this. Now, the first thing that they do is number one. ARMS. R, which stands for Adjustable Rate Mortgage. Well, Bulgarian bankers are saying, oh, we have no interest rate risk simply because we use only ARMS. Well, the first thing we know is from SNLs is that SNLs used back in the old days when things got real hard, they began to use ARMS. And ARMS blow up even worse than fixed interest rates. Why an arm is a really, really bad thing? Well, by now you should know why, because arms fueled the real estate bubble over the last couple of years, over the last two, three, four years, and a huge amount increase in arms, and arms were used to inflate real estate, in other words, to understate uh, borrowing, at least the cash flows in the early stages of uh, borrowing and now arms are blowing up big time. So what is arm doing? Arm sa simply says that if market interest rates rise we will raise the payments on the borrower and if interest rates fall we will you know lower interest rates on the borrower. Usually arm is associated with lower interest rates at initiation as opposed to fixed interest rate. So Borrowers have the short-term incentive to borrow on an adjustable rate mortgage because they can borrow at 4% instead of at 6 all right? Because if uh, they're borrowing fixed rate, this means that the lender assumes the interest rate risk. And if he's going to assume the risk, he will assume it only for a compensation for the interest rate uh, risk, all right? So that extra premium represents the compensation for the lender. Well, if it's 4%, the guy is saying, oh, I'm gonna be paying 4% instead of six. So I can borrow, essentially, I can borrow 50% more. I can afford, instead of $100,000 house, I can afford $150,000 house. And remember, because in real estate booms, people understand incorrectly that real estate is the greatest investment in the world, and they understand that it's the safest investment in the world. Houses are no longer perceived as a place where you go to sleep, they're perceived as investments. So at that point, greed kicks in and consumers are eager to buy the biggest house possible in order to make the biggest amount of profit or gain possible with other people's money, all right? So essentially buying the house is not lo no longer the regular purchase of a consumption good like we buy uh, juices or like we buy pens or like we buy uh, cars, which, you know, assets that depreciate but it's bought for profit. And of course, the retail customer doesn't really understand that every so often, real estate usually crashes, all right? And when it crashes, they blow up with their own real estate, and in the process, you know, they burn their own bank. That's a whole different story. Anyway, ARM does the following. The interest rate risk does not disappear. The interest rate risk is there. It's still there. If interest rates triple, the risk is still there. Someone's going to bear the burden of tripling interest rate. All that the arm does is shift the interest rate risk from the bank to the consumer. 
So suddenly, the interest rate risk means that when you double interest rates, and sooner or later they do double, this means that you double the payment of the consumer. And if the consumer overborrow and in a real estate boom they always do, then the consumer blows up, meaning the consumer defaults. For example, in Bulgaria you have, let's say, just using dollars, uh, people with you know ordinary income of thousand dollars, they borrowed a, for a house, and the payment was four hundred and fifty. And four hundred and fifty for the family is bearable. It's a little bit too much, but bearable. They can handle it. You know, they can handle it. one, two, three years. They can handle it. You double the interest rates as now they are rising, and the four fifty payment suddenly becomes nine hundred payment. And when the total income is thousand, you suddenly re realize that you did not have a margin of error. When the payment is nine hundred and your income is thousand, what do you do? You scramble. You you know uh, try to get a little extra work. The spouse will do a little extra work. Will you'll sell the house? You're not gonna buy the computer. You're gonna borrow from a father, from a brother, and whatnot. You struggle for three, for six, for nine, for twelve months, possibly for two years, and eventually you give up because the market. We call it. Uh, let's use a new term: financial distress. Financial. Distress is difficulty to uh, cover your normal expenses, your normal necessary expenses, and service your debt at the same time. So the financial distress sooner or later takes over. So all you did was you transferred the interest rate risk to the consumer. Now, the question is the following. Which one is better? Is it better that the financial institution bears the interest rate risk or that the consumers bear the interest rate risk? Which one is better? Huh? Sorry? I guess. Which one is better? The, the, the financial, the bank bears the risk or the consumer bears yeah. it? Huh? Yeah. The bank. Why the bank? Because the consumer. Very, very simple. The bank has an army of bankers who are highly sophisticated, number one, to forecast the economy, to forecast interest rates, and to manage those interest rates somehow to adjust and to adapt. The consumer is incapable. He can't see interest rates rising, he can't see that there might be problems, and when he sees them, he's got nothing to do. He's already deep into debt, all right? So, the consumer, number one, is not sophisticated, and number two is powerless. The bank might decide to borrow, it might get help from the central bank, it might get help from another bank, yeah. it might get into a merger, into an acquisition, issue more shares. Uh, in other words, the bank has infinitely more options, on top of infinitely better sophistication and professionalism, to manage interest rate risk. So, usually using arms is a recipe for disaster. And it always has been. What do they do again in arms? How do they adjust the rate? They adjust the rate according to some market interest rate. How do they adjust them? For example, they look up LIBOR or LIBOR. This is lender interbank offered rate. This is what banks do to each other. So they say that R will equal LIBOR plus 2%. So LIBOR is 3%, your R payment is 5. LIBOR rises to 5, your R rises to 7. LIBOR rises to 10, your R rises to 12. LIBOR falls to 1, R falls to 3. So, LIBOR is one. Now, in Europe, we have our equivalent we call Euribor. And this is for Euro. So, Euro Interbank Offered Rate. So, this is what European banks lend to each other in Euro. All right? And whatever it was, it has been going down and down and down and down and down for the last five or eight, well, let's say as 
the euro was introduced in 1999 for almost 10 years. It's been going down. So everything was fine and dandy. Nobody perceived any risk. Well, now people are beginning to wake up and say, Oh my God, they raised my mortgage to 10%. It was six and a half. I'm paying 50% more. And the answer is, wait and see until they double your mortgage payments. Because they will. Because interest rates are barely beginning to rise in the Eurozone in Euro currency. You know, it's just starting. This trend is just starting. You've got 10 years downtrend in interest rate. What? You're going to get one year of uptrend and that's it? Well, it doesn't work like that. When I get 10 years of downtrend, you got 10 years of uptrends. We call this seven bad years are followed by seven good years, or the opposite. Seven good years are followed by seven bad years, right? <laughs> right? So, well, that's how it's in the Bible, right? So, the, the idea is you don't have good times going on forever. And cycles for stocks, for bonds, for real estate, for interest rates, go in long-term cycles. You may get a 10-12 year uh, cycle in the one direction, 10-12 year in the other direction. So, starting from 19, uh, let's say 66, 1966, interest rates were going up and up and up all the way to 1980. For 15 years, interest rates went up. Then, for 29 years, from 1980 all the way to 2009, interest rates were going down. Over here they were low, 2, 3 percent. Over here they were high, 20, 21 percent. Long-term interest rates were 15, all right? So, now we have for 29 years interest rates going down, so what? You're going to just go up for one year, that's the end of the story? No, that's the, barely the beginning of the story. You going to be seeing interest rates, you know, rising from now on, whether one, three or five years, and as interest rates rise, you're going to see the real banking blow-ups. Well, no, the whole credit crisis, we're just warming up to it for the simple reasons that interest rates in 2009 are historically low, historically low interest rate. You had short-term interest rates a quarter of a percent down to zero, and then long-term interest rates at two and a half percent the lowest in American financial history. And banks are blowing up. Now imagine 5% interest rate. Well, imagine 10. And the answer is, you wouldn't have to. You will live through that. Maybe 5, maybe 10 years from now, maybe 3 years from now, and then wait to see what happens. Question? Yes, everybody uses labor plus something. Yeah, okay. Well, and everybody uses arms? Yes, well, then, well, everybody in Bulgaria, everybody yeah, in Bulgaria. Yeah, everybody in Saudi. Like, yeah, well, uh, that you're means, saying... That means it's not good for us. It's no, it just mean, this fair. means that, uh, you know, Saudi banking system, just like the Bulgarian, so sooner or later, was going to blow up big time. You just haven't seen the LIBOR rising a lot. It has now been... Now LIBOR is going down, actually. Yes, LIBOR now has been relaxing a little bit. It's going down, but it's been going down for 29 years. How much more? Eventually. Two years, yeah, it's three it's years, it's five years, eventually yeah, I mean, it will go up. And it, when it goes up, the banking system is going to be, you know, it, you know, it's going to be crushed. Oh, which which yeah, system is better than arms? Well, that's a whole yeah, different story. On the, on the back, well, the idea is that as long as you have a gap, duration gap, there is no good system. The good system, in other words, the core of the problem is borrowing short and lending long, which at the Reason. core of the problem is the fractional reserve banking. Fractional reserve banking, one way or another, will get you into this credit boom and then will get you into the credit bust. And the credit bust means that interest rates skyrocket eventually, eventually. Again, whether it's two or ten years, it's difficult or impossible to say, but sooner or later it does happen. All right, so arms is the one way to manage, but it turns out that you aren't really managing. You're deluding yourself that you're managing it, when in reality, you don't. Every time historically you had arms, they always blow up. Uh, well, they did blow up hundred years before that when you had the uh, 
B and L, let's use red, B and L, which were back historically known as Buildings and Loans Association in the late 900s, oh, sorry, 800s. The crisis of 18, if I remember correctly, 93, they blew up big time. All right. So back then, of course, they don't want to use they, uh, uh, you know, building a whole association. So what they do is, it's the same old game. You put a different name. Yes. So now it becomes S and L. All right. So uh, again, uh, it's the same old story over and over and over again in history, and they repeat it over and over every 20 years or so. I mean, the Swiss banking system just suffered, a, you know, 20 years ago suffered a crushing defeat. The whole Nordic countries, this whole Scandinavian banking crisis, they went through this wild and crazy real estate bubble after which the whole banking system blew up. The whole banking system had to be completely nationalized and you know, did all the problems and whatnot. And 20 years later, they go through it all over again. When I was uh, presenting in, in Helsinki last year, uh, well, this was exactly one year ago, uh, in May 2008, uh, at a gold conference, they were showing me right on the beach, kind of like on the, uh, uh, on the beach on the Baltic, they showed me these nice little apartments and said, do you know how much they cost? I said, no, one minute. So, oh, you got yourself one hell of a bubble <laughs> going on, right? That people didn't understand it as a bubble. They just saw it and that, you know, you good know, one time. One a lot or little? It's an awful lot for a tiny little apartment. One million euro is is a huge amount of money. You know, I gotta be crazy to be paying one million. Well, because it was on the ocean. Well, it's actually the seafront. All right. Uh, it, so it was one million. So the, you know, you people gotta be crazy. Well, it's not crazy. People are just living through a real estate bubble, and everyone's buying real estate like crazy. This was before the real credit crunch hit. All right. So everyone was still going on like this. I mean, we had a similar in Bulgaria, but I don't want to get into that, you know, where people are buying from Bulgaria and see, again, these uh, hotels and villas and everything, prices were five, ten times inflated and whatnot. Well, they've fallen already 60, 70, 80 percent. You know, the bubble already burst in Bulgaria. And it continues to fall, but that's a different story. So, uh, did, did I answer your question? Or? Yeah. All right. Very All right. Nice. Number two, they use interest rate futures. Interest rate futures. Well, the futures is a... Standardized. No, yeah, zero-sum game. Zero-sum game means that if one person wins, the other, lose. The other one loses. It okay. means that it's not a positive sum game. So when one financial institution hedges its risk against interest rate and the, uh, the hedge works, meaning that the market goes against them and they win, meaning make up on their hedge, this means that their counterparty lost on the hedge. Yes. So interest rate futures do hedge interest rate risk for one institution, for one person, for one corporation, for 50 corporations, but futures cannot hedge the full financial system. If you hedge half the companies or corporations, the other half will still have exposure and will blow up in, you know, in return. The only way that interest rate futures may possibly work is if you're hedging the futures against a party which is outside the banking system. So Bulgarian banks uh, have interest rate futures in London and hedging against London banks or hedging against Saudi banks or against US banks or against Japanese banks, all right? So the Japanese banks will be hedging interest rate risk, risk against Bulgaria, US, Saudi Arabia, and hoping that all interest rates globally will not move in the same direction against them, against them so that they can blow up. In other words, when they are exposing the same to interest rate risk, what they'll try to do is to diversify their interest rate risk by, you know, exposure to Latin America, in Eastern Europe, in Western Europe, 
and I don't know, Africa, the Middle East. So this is the only way that interest rates futures work. But here's the problem. The US banking system is so big that there is not enough uh, you know, other banking systems, whether it's the Saudi banking system or the British or the Chinese or the Tokyo, the Japanese banking system, to hedge the full American interest rate risk. So interest rate futures usually work for one party, for one institution, for a small segment, segment of the financial industry in general, for financial institutions. They may work for a small country, like uh, let's say uh, Bulgaria. Bulgaria is a tiny little country with a tiny little banking system. Uh, for Latvia, for Estonia, for small countries it will work as long as you have huge counterparty. Although it's very common that a small country can bankrupt a huge bank, you know, like Citigroup or HSBC, could blow up if they get too much of an exposure against one country. All right, is that yes. fairly clear? Yeah. All right, three, three, three is interest rate swaps. And interest rate swaps is exactly the same story. Interest rate swap Everybody is... Everybody uses it. Yeah, everybody is using them and the answer is yes, they work until they stop working. All right, they always work until they stop working. In other words, the interest rate swap is a swap of two cash flows. And again, one is fixed, one is floating. One is fixed, one is floating, and the cash flow usually will swap is a again, a zero sum game. A swap does not create value. It does not create stability. All it does is hedge one party against the other party, all right? And one party's net gains are the other party's net losses. So an interest rate swap is a variation on the futures, but fundamentally the nature is identical. It is a zero-sum game where the one who, you know, uh, takes the hedge it, you know, is exposing its counterparty, and if the counterparty gets too large, it will blow up sooner or later. What do you mean? The swaps, they hedge the, I mean, they hedge the other party, right? And they're supposed to... I mean... Well, okay, you have party A and party B. So, one party A is hedging let's, itself let's with say, the swap. A bank and a corporation. Right, so the corporation okay. will hedge itself and the bank, what will the bank do? The bank Go will... Go hedge itself against, against the hedging. Oh, oh, okay, so, no, 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 it, 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 we say hedge against the hedge, hedge against the hedge, doesn't work. No, 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 <laughs> well, you, you, you work the way it is, you say there is corporation A, okay. all right, and there is a bank B. So, corporation A makes the hedge, but if A makes the hedge, this means that B, the bank, gets the exposure. What's the bank B going to do? Hedge. Hedge against whom? Against me? No, someone else. Oh, C. who's someone else? C. 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 Is it another bank? Yeah. All right. So B uh, uh, hedges against C. All that it did was A transferred the interest rate risk to B. B transferred to C. C. Well, what's the C going to do? Say, oh, you're going to use. Someone else. They're going to. They're going to. Uh, they're going to. You know, shift to D. <laughs> so all that it happens is this oh, yeah. hedging is even worse. Why? Because it's a beautiful, how do we call this whole thing? Vicious circle. Vicious circle. No, no, no. We got a better word in English. Uh, Bonuses? Girls? How do we call this thing? Business cycle. Uh, oh, no bonuses. <laughs> yeah. Come on. What it's it's your what turn. What do we call what? Uh, we, 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 we call this here the chain reaction. A hedges with B, B with C, D with E, E with F. How do we call this contagion. chain? Cont contagion. Yeah, yeah, well, yeah, yeah, you get the contagion effect, but what's the nature of this type of uh, business arrangement? <laughs> uh, let's see if you've heard it in English before. Domino effect. Domino! Domino effect! effect. <laughs> yes, domino effect. So, all you can do is get a domino effect. D blows up, 
then C blows up in return, when C blows up, B blows up, and then A. So all you need is one of the dominoes to fall, and then, you know, the, the whole deck falls. So you, all you're doing is creating a domino. But the point is the same. You do not eliminate the risk. All you did is transfer it from A to B to C to D. Well, what they do is modern portfolio theory. And according to modern portfolio theory, what you will do is diversify. Oh, I'm going to diversify. Oh, and he's going to diversify. But what happens is everyone gets diversified. But diversification, and let's clarify because this was one of the most abused concepts in the current credit crisis, that they, all the diversification does is ensure that when the blow up comes, they blow up together. <laughs> all right, let's try to, 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 to explain this uh, diversification, which is grossly misunderstood, and of course journalists don't understand it, so grossly misrepresented. So they say here is uh, the greatest country in the world, you have here, let's say, Florida, and they say, oh, what we're doing with real estate, we get some San Francisco, we get some LA, we get some New York, we get some Boston, we get some Florida, uh, this is Ohio, you get some Texas and whatnot. So what they do is they diversify. And, you know, you ex get exposed to too much San Francisco, ah, oh, maybe bad, diversify with this, diversify with this, diversify with this. Well, if one party diversifies really well, and remember, the second party diversifies equally well, what's the result when two, diverse, the, the two parties the, diversify uh, very well? This simply means that both parties will have remarkably similar portfolios. So, if, if, if one lender is here and diversifies with D6, now the second lender is here and diversifies with D6, over time, diversification leads to extremely similar portfolios. And when the portfolios are extremely similar, the result is that when one becomes vulnerable, all of them become vulnerable. So you, you eliminate the individual risk, but still the market risk. Yes, so, but you create a systemic risk where instability in one usually will mean instability in all of them at the same so time. So finance in itself is a bad thing? No, I never said finance in itself is a bad thing. Because everything what, leads to something bad. So. Yeah, no, everything leads to something bad because it's practiced the way it is. Now, what is bad is borrow short and then long. So, what is bad is... is greed. Greed. No, no, not greed, not greed. No, don't mistake greed is fractional reserve banking, which is practiced today in its modern form, is at the core fundamentally flawed and at the core is unstable. So you're trying to build unstable, an inverted pyramid. And as the pyramid grows, it becomes more and more unstable. And sooner or later, one way or another, it blows up. And what they try to do is build again an inverted pyramid based on fractional reserve banking. And again, 10, 20, 30 years later, it blows up again. So it is nothing is wrong with it's banking. It's the fractional. It, it is the nature of the financial uh, uh, system, which is fractional. It is the nature, number one, of the monetary system, which is fractional, and then the banking system, which is fractional, and it is inherently unstable. This is what your exam was, or for the other guys, is that the banking system is inherently uh, bankrupt at all times. So, it is inherently uh, uh, un uh, unstable too. And all you try to do is you try to keep it up and running, but the only way to keep it up and running is to keep it by expanding in a classic pyramid scheme. And in the process of keeping and maintaining the pyramid, you make it only more unstable. 
and the solution is to revert to you know, to, instead of uh, fractional reserve where the, uh, the reserve ratio is low, to increase the reserve ratio to 50 to 70 to 100 percent. But banks don't want to do that because too much greed says, so no, we more. no, we want to gain more. So usually they uh, sacrifice short, you know, long-term stability for uh, short-term gains. Professor, I said the contingent effect, and it's the same as domino. Huh? What? I said contingent effect. Uh, well, no, 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 not contingent. <laughs> Let's write it out in English. Let's write it out. No, I deserve the bonus point. Uh, well. No, professor, come on, I deserve it. It's the same. Contingent. Contingent. Yes. Contingent. Yes, that's what I meant. Okay, I know that's what you meant. But so you I deserve the bonus uh, point. No. It's the same as domino. Come on, professor, come on. We'll review the recording. And we'll find out who said it first. Did I? Said, I? <laughs> I said contain. Con All right. Well, you you know, you keep arguing, you're gonna get a penalty point. No. Nope. <laughs> All right. Let's you know, just keep arguing. You're gonna get the penalty point. You're gonna lose too. All right. Let's move on. Adjustable rate and interest rate and futures and conclusions. All right. Now there is another very tricky risk, which is part of interest rate risk management. It is not per se interest rate risk. It is a separate type of risk, but morphs. Here is the key. So what you're trying to do is arm, you shift the arm, and when you use adjustable rate mortgage, what you do is you shift interest rate risk into a credit risk. So the interest rate risk is reduced or eliminated, but you suddenly increase the credit risk, all right? Well, here is another type of risk known in finance as uh, prepayment risk. So, you have prepayment. Prepayment risk is the risk that the borrower will prepay their own loan in full early and the lender will get the cash and possibly not be able to reinvest it at the same return with a comparable risk. Alright, so re prepayment risk usually results in what is known in finance. So as soon as you allow the option of borrowers to prepay, they, you know, decide to prepay. Well, when were they going to prepay risk? When are they going to prepay? Well, they're going to prepay when they refinance. Means they will borrow again and pay, pay. back the original mortgage and they will refinance when interest rates go down. Alright, so when interest rates go down, they will refinance. So, in a falling interest rate environment, you have a rising prepaid risk as a result of refinancing, so mortgage refinancing. And then the prepayment risk results in another type of risk which is called reinvestment risk. And the reinvestment risk is the risk that when you receive cash flow as a result of prepayment, you will not be able to invest it in the same or for the same return with a comparable risk. Alright? So, turns out that when you have a reinvestment risk, reinvestment risk is rising with falling interest rates. So, the faster interest rates fall, usually you get a lot of prepayment risk and reinvestment risk. Well, as interest rates fall and everybody is reinvesting, suddenly the bank is facing not only reinvestment risk, but the reinvestment risk because everyone has refinanced close to the lowest point. For example, in the US had this refi boom where everybody refinanced at 3 4% interest rate. The result is that the the higher or the faster falling interest rate resulting in reinvestment risk morphs into an interest rate risk. 
In other words, on the way down, the prepayment risk materializes. It results in a lot of reinvestments, uh, refinancing and reinvestment. And at the bottom, close to the bottom, when interest rate turn up, suddenly the interest rate risk is in full force. All right. So turns out that again, the one risk begins to morph into a second risk. All right. Now in Bulgaria, we have currency risk morphing into credit risk all right i mean so the, all of those different types of risk they morph into each other you try to manage liquidity you you know you reduce one risk you raise a different risk all right so let's see what else we have we have number seven valuation of mortgages uh, i will skip the whole section i skip the, you know, for all institutions i skip the section on valuations which you don't need to uh, prepare interaction with other financial institutions. You have a nice little chapter, you know, with the central bank, with commercial banks, with credit unions, blah blah blah. There is nothing really interesting. Uh, performance of financial institutions, not really interesting. So let's focus on the most important part of this chapter, which is the SNL crisis. And this is our last section for the next or for the last 20 five or thirty minutes because this is where the lesson can be learned. We don't learn the lesson by, well these are the assets, these are liabilities. We learn the lesson by understanding what went wrong and how today we are repeating the same mistakes that were committed thirty years ago without having learned the lesson appropriately. So let's start a brand new section. It is actually big. Uh, the first thing which I found was that in my memory, the SNL crisis was very different from the textbook. Uh, so the first thing that I discovered is that the whole description of the SNL crisis here is terrible. I didn't understand anything from it. Said, well. This is not what I understand about the SNL crisis. I knew something completely different. So I had to go on the internet, do some research. Uh, in other words, do my homework, right? <laughs> to find out that uh, the textbook's presentation is really bad and uh, really lousy and tells only the last part of the story, but doesn't tell the uh, real story. So what is the... Uh, real story. Well, let's first write out what they're saying, uh, what they're saying on the textbook, and then see how terrible the, the presentation is. They say the main reason are three. Number one is loan. Loan losses. Number two is fraud. And number three, they say illiquidity. 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 Well, the story at this level is shockingly primitive. Loan losses. Where did the losses come from? What caused the losses, right? Wait. You need to spend a long time to figure this part out. Yeah. Then fraud, well, where did the fraud come from? I mean, usually, you know, American banking system is not like that. You know, where did fraud? And number three, illiquidity. Well, they just suddenly became illiquid. Kind of like Bulgarian banking system today. Suddenly the whole banking system is illiquid and it came out of nowhere. Well, these things don't work like that. I mean, it, it, you know, the whole banking system just doesn't get out, you know, illiquid out of nowhere. So, the way to start number one is the first original cause is uh, duration, duration gap. gap and interest rate risk. And the interest rate risk actually materialized. They actually materialized. So, during the 60s, 
interest rates were very low, so you had a booming lending industry, and what these institutions did, they assumed the interest rate risk. So they were fundamentally in or imprudent. They were doing the wrong things. For 10 years they engaged in this terrible practice where they were borrowing short and lending long in a low interest rate environment. This is the root cause. They did for 10 years and this what triggered a big chain of events. All right. So interest rate risk was, let's try to do this. Uh, the risk was assumed, in other words, you take the risk in the 60s and it materialized, materialized in the 70s. In other words, 60s were characterized by low interest rate environment and 70s, let's not call it high, let's call it rising, rising interest rate environment. So right there you have the genuine cause. This is the fundamental, but this is going for 15 years and as the industry is suffering through the 70s, they try a number of fixes which only make things worse. worse. So the second big fix, which was very quick and very easy, was interest rate ceilings. This is what I discussed already twice, one a few lectures ago and one today. The Fed imposed in 1966 an interest rate ceiling because it, it, you know, from an extremely low environment, interest rates began to creep up and profitability was eroded so they said all right let's impose a quick fix and turned out a quick fix resulted in making things worse. worse exacerbating by having funds flow out of the commercial banking system and at the same time out of the time out of the savings institutions out of the thrifts into the money market mutual funds so interest rate ceilings resulted in, uh, uh, let's put it this way, outflows, outflows of SNLs, outflows, let's call it from SNLs and inflows, inflows for or into mutual. money market mutual funds, into money market instruments. So this was another major Cause. All right, let's see what else we have. The third reason was, uh, let's call it imprudent, imprudent lending. What does imprudent lending mean? This means that you begin to lend to people who are credit worthy. It is the old version of today's subprime lending, subprime borrowing. All right, so why imprudent lending? Well, the way to do is as you begin to do some losses and losses begin to exacerbate, you have, as a financial institution, one out of two solutions. You cannot continue on the same way because you're going to go bankrupt. You have one of two things. When you begin to run losses as a bank, you are going down, so you must necessarily do one of two things. Stop lending. It results in a credit crunch. In other words, stop all lending, keep collecting and try to manage liquidity and try to shrink the financial institution as fast as possible and what we call to cure the portfolio. In other words, you clean out the portfolio out of the bed and by stopping the lending you don't assume any more risk. So that's the one natural reaction that is the 
imprudent reaction. The imprudent reaction, but the other way out, if it works out, is accelerate. Accelerate. In other words, you are growing your portfolio 20% and your portfolio is going bad and bad and bad. And, you know, the, the bad loans grow, you know, from 1% to 2%, from 2% to 3%, from 3% to 4%. And your only way out is instead of growing at 20%, you got to grow at 50 And if you grow at 50 then the 4% default rate suddenly shrinks to 3 Do you understand this or not really? All right, so uh, you get, uh, let's call it outstanding portfolio. The outstanding is 1,000. And you got a bad debt or bad loans of uh, 4%. So 4% is a very high default rate. So out of these 1,000, 960 are good and 40 is bad. And we say, we're going to grow our way out of it. How? We grow 50%. So from 1,000, next time around is 1,500. All right. So the 40 will grow to maybe, I don't know, 50. Oh, so there's 40 a grows to 50, but the good one grows to 40 and 50. Well, 40 on 1,000 is. 4%. So 40 on 1,000 is 4%. But now 50 on 500 is roughly 3%. So your portfolio will improve if you accelerate from 20% to 50% and the new loans don't go bad as rapidly. So the new loans from 40 go up to 50. So you increase your portfolio at 50%, but uh, the overall debt going bad is going down, you know, is going down at a slower rate. So the average for the full portfolio falls. So let's say C portfolio is improving. We have a 4% default rate, now it's 3%. But what is the problem with this logic? The problem with this logic is that you just added this year, now you added from 1,000 to 500, you added a net of 500. And the net 500 will not blow up on you this year. If you originated the loan in September, it won't blow up in December. It's going to blow up in next September. So by next September, when it begins to blow up, it will raise your percentage of default. Your only solution is from 1,500 to grow to 2,500. All right, so you raise by 60%. All right, so as the new ones begin to blow up more and more, you accelerate more and more. Well, what this does is it buys you time. one year of time, but things go bad because you made these 500, but you made them in a rush and they can't be good. Apparently, you know, if your portfolio was bad, whatever you accumulated over the last worse. 10 years, you just made it worse. But you made it worse, but at the same time, you made it look better when it was in reality worse. Well, now you're increasing by another thousand. So up to now for 10, 20 years, you accumulated a balance of 1,000. Now you increase the balance of 1,000 in one year. So in one year you add extra debt of what you did accumulate over the last 10 years. Well, if this was already accumulated in good times for 10 years with good bank management, uh, risk management, and it was going bad, imagine how terrible will be the last 1,000. I mean, this is the same, and if you had to grow, the portfolio's got to be really terrible. In other words, anybody who applied for a loan, you got to give him one just to... So what you did was, you bought yourself another year, but the portfolio is getting really terrible. And then the next year, what you do is, you go to... Oh my God. 4,000. Oh my God. <laughs> yeah. So this is how you grow your way out of your problem. But it doesn't always work, all right? So, 
imprudent lending is usually, this whole discussion is usually, let's clear this up to provide it the way we do for, you know, third graders, is caused by a banking institution adopting to accelerate and grow its way out of it. So, another major fundamental cause for the crisis. All right, let's see what else. Uh, another reason which was from the duration gap materialized, this materialization, I'll write it out separately, was a result of a really bad monetary policy throughout the 60s, which uh, was associated with financing uh, the Vietnam War and social security. So highly inflationary monetary policy throughout the 60s materialized in higher inflationary environment in the 70s and in the late 70s what you got was fighting inflation Paul Walker was assigned who raised early on from 10% interest rates to well over 20% can you imagine Saudi banking system with 20% interest rates no well, I can imagine we, we the Bulgarian. Five, or yeah, six. I understand. Bulgarian banking system of 20% is just going to collapse in a matter of days or weeks, all right? I can imagine a lot of bankings. Well, he had to raise interest rates. So, what we have is spiking interest rates in 1980. Well, all the way to 1980. 82, but I don't want to get into the details that they spiked interest rate in 1980. The whole banking system suddenly was in convulsions. They had to lower interest rates in 1980 to alleviate the pain, but the pain was alleviated at the cost of even higher inflation, so they had to tighten one more time in 1982. This was a terrible recession, and this was again another terrible recession, and interest rates went up to 20, let's say 21% were short-term interest rates and long-term interest rates were 15%. Can you imagine long-term interest rates at 15%? That's going to be a complete disaster. Well, it was a complete disaster for all of those who borrowed short and lent long. So, spiking interest rates that were caused by totally different stuff uh, all of them became a collateral damage. All of them became a collateral damage. Well, you also got yourself 1982 or so on, the Mexican crisis, the Latin American crisis, and our collateral damage was a whole bunch of countries around the world that blew up because they did the same thing. They borrowed short at low interest rates, and when interest rates went sky high, you know, they blew up. All right, so spiking interest rates was the second reason. Now, what the next thing they did was, number five, is deregulation. These were decently regulated, and they said, we got to let them grow out of their problems. So 1980 was one big hard year where the banking system was on the verge of collapse. So in 1980, they re-changed the law and allowed these SNLs to go from mortgages into corporate loans, into consumer loans, into credit cards, into a whole bunch of other things, including junk bonds. So the deregulation, they said they went on a lending binge where they adopted the accelerate strategy and they started lending to consumers, they started lending to corporations, they started getting big time, and I mean real big time into junk bonds, all right? So they decided at that time that they had such huge interest rates on deposits that the only way to grow their way out is to get even higher interest rates on their loan. Well, the only way to get a high interest rate in a falling interest rate environment is to assume higher risk. 
Well, the highest possible risk to get is getting yourself into junk bonds. And junk bonds at that time were new and they weren't experienced. So deregulation got themselves into the junk bond business. As they let later learned, junk bonds were really junk, as they found out later. All right. But now they stopped. Uh, they stopped lending. The first phase, what they did, they stopped lending, right? The no. price, when the crisis came, I mean now. When the crisis came, they say, no, we got to let them lend even more. Yeah. This is the same of what now the Bush administration, oh sorry, the Obama administration before that the Bush administration is doing. They say, we got to keep the mortgages going. We can't allow the mortgage market to stop because real estate is going to crash and it's going to have a whole bunch of repercussions. So we got to keep lending going. So right now they nationalized Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac and Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac are doing it three times worse than they were doing it before. Before they were private and they had some risk management and whatnot and you know they went totally bankrupt. Now that their government they started even accelerating making it even worse. So usually they never want to go through the deflationary bust. They usually want to Reinflate, and the reinflation means that you gotta accelerate further, hoping for the better. All right. So what they did is, with this, they don't say, "Oh no, we gotta stop the lending." But here they stopped lending. Well, that's a different story. So here, but they didn't what, accelerate yet. Well, so here what they did is they adopted the first no. solution. Well. There, they adopted the second. So, as you get to the critical point, the critical point, you can't go the straight road. You gotta swing left into no lending at all, or you gotta swing right into accelerate wildly. All right? So, here, you stop lending, and the answer is no wonder you stop lending in 2008, and everyone is predicting 2009 that Saudi Arabian economy is gonna go through a recession, which will be a really good thing because it's going to cleanse the banking economy, it's going to cool off. Everyone's now crazy about real estate. Probably there's a whole bunch of real estate bubbles in different areas, right? You already have it on Olea Road, people paying 20000 whatever for, you know, square meter for a square meter. No, people are going to be crazy, you know? What's wrong with us? 20, when one of the guys was telling me, 50,000 real. Can you imagine $10,000 for a square meter of land because it was on a whole road, meaning between Olay and King Pond? Right? They say in Saudi Arabia, the bubble is going to stay a little bit longer. Yeah, it's going to stay a little bit longer. I know, you know why? Because there's still consumption. There's yeah, still there's consumption still consumption, 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 consumption going, going on. on. Well, yeah, I, I understand. But the point is that you get all of those things. So actually, if you stop lending is really good because the banking system will will cool off, the consumer will cool off, uh, real estate will cool off, and the economy will re-normalize because it was getting overheated over the last two, three, four years, especially when I came a year ago and I was hearing these crazy lending stories going on here about, you know, everyone buying everything on credit cards and, you know, all of these brand new BMWs and whatnot bought, of course, on credit, not on real savings. But back to deregulation, they got themselves real big time into the junk bond business. All right, so another reason was the oil bust. What the hell has got to do anything with America? Oil bust means that oil prices crashed, Saudi Arabia felt the pain big time, but Texas felt the pain because Texas was the biggest oil producing state in, in uh, America. Oklahoma fell because it was our oil producing state. So oil and oil money has this peculiar nature when you know the oil market begins to boom it always results in a wild and crazy real estate bubble well SNLs were in the mortgage business and SNLs were instrumental in fueling, fueling the real estate bubble in Texas Oklahoma and the so-called oil states so you had a wild 
the crazy real estate bubble in the 70s and in the early 80s as the oil bust came, real estate bubble burst. So real estate bubble burst. So yeah, they had low losses, but when, why did they get the low losses? The answer is that they financed the real estate bubble in a totally imprudent manner during a low interest rate environment and when interest rates rose, the bubble burst. Of course, it was associated with falling oil prices and there you got yourself the big losses. So, what they tried to do is they tried to grow their way out of the real estate bubble bursting by using more junk bonds. So, 1970s, the real big crisis for the SNL was 1980 and then 1982. But you didn't get the bankruptcies. You didn't get the bankruptcies because the government decided to help them out in a number of ways and they let them, you know, deregulate, they let them get into junk bonds, they let them get into much bigger things. So suddenly in the 80s, if you want to grow your way out, you got to grow 1,000, 1,500, 2,500, 4,000, 10,000, 30,000. So turns out that allowing them to proceed through the 80s made the problem, surprise, 10 times bigger. 10 times bigger. So the oil bust was another fundamental cause. All right. Now, another, yes, we're going to finish in about three, five minutes, I hope, right? Do we have five minutes? The, another big reason was a change in the tax law. Tax law was saying if you had a passive real estate investment, you were not taxed high rate, you were taxed at low rate. 1986 was the tax reform and in the tax reform they said, oh, now you're getting taxed. And suddenly the tax gains were lost and when you capitalize through present value all the tax gains that they were all expecting now becoming to be, you know, differentially tax losses, suddenly, you know, this reflected in 10-20% in real estate values. Well, they were having invested in mortgages and in real estate Suddenly, you start taxing real estate, real estate prices crash, and suddenly, this was a big, big blow. All right, deregulation. Now, broker deposit was another big one. Broker deposit was associated with the, uh, not in the textbook. 100,000 deposit limit. You got a 100,000 deposit, is it insured by the federal government? You got 200,000 deposit and the institution blows up, you maintain, you get 100,000, the other 200,000 evaporates. So the technique was, oh, I'm going to be a broker. If you give me a million, I'm going to slice it and dice it into 10 different financial institutions, each 100,000, so your million will be still secure and fully covered by the insurance. Well, the result of this broker deposit was that uh, you get your million to the broker and the broker puts it, the money into the most, into the most, uh, uh, you know, into that institution which gives you the highest interest rate. So suddenly deposits due to broker deposit become extremely volatile. Volatile means that today they're in this bank, but you gave it to the broker and he sees next week or next month higher interest rate there, he takes it from here and gets it there. So the result of these broker deposits was that now you get this professional management of all deposits. Deposits started flowing, flowing around the, the whole system. So suddenly you got these, which I uh, said, said before, rate wars. Suddenly they started, you know, a war on interest rates driven by volatile deposits, which was caused by broker deposits to circumvent another regulation. If FDIC raised the limit to one million, 
this whole problem would disappear. Well, ideally, there should be no guarantee, but that's a whole different topic about stability. So that was another thing. And let's see, fraud. Finally, there was a lot of fraud, plain and simple. Fraud and incompetence. What are we talking about here? We're talking about the following. You got 10,000 commercial banks with you know, 50,000 or maybe 1 million bankers in them. Then you got, remember, mutual funds, how many? 8,000 mutual funds, remember? Then we had money market funds, how many? 3,000 money market funds. Then we got pension funds, how many? 5,000 pension funds. Then you got savings and loans, how many? I don't know, 10,000? So you suddenly get like 50, 60,000 financial institutions. You can't get trained bankers and expertise for all financial institutions. Well, savings and loans weren't really good at attracting talent. So they were just attracting some people. So you had these financial institutions with a lot of incompetence, and then you had a lot of fraud going on. Fraud, the textbook's got great detail about uh, fraud. These managers were buying yachts, they were buying jets, they were buying helicopters, they were buying million dollar exotic cars, Lamborghinis, Ferraris and whatnot. The textbook uh, you know, talks about uh, football tickets, remember the textbook talks about uh, fraudulent loans. I'm manager of you know, uh, SNL 1A and B, I'm going to give you a million dollar loan at 1%, you're going to give me a million dollar at 1%, right? So they were making these fraudulent loans. They were using, as the textbook clarifies, topless dancers, prostitutes, to entertain, guess who? The regulators. The regulators. So, turns out that the regulator is entertained, and the result is the regulator is not watching. He's not doing his job. The cause we call this whole picture, we call corruption. So you have fraud plus incompetence coupled with regulator corruption. Co uh, regulators were getting big bribes, they were getting all sorts of tickets, benefits and everything else paid at the depositor's expense. Well, eventually from 1987 to 1989, the whole financial system blew up and well over 3,000 of them went bankrupt in a very short period of time. So what they did from 1980, rather than allow them to fall, they allowed them seven, eight, nine more years of time and they made the problem 10 times bigger, at that time estimated to be $150 billion, the biggest blow up in American history. Well, 10 years later, the blow up was 10 times bigger. Alright, is this good enough? Alright, we're done.